So hello and welcome to today's episode of the complete history of Rockstar's Bully. Today's episode we're going to be going over the history of Bully's development on the PS2. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the first episode in the series which covered how Bully was initially conceived and how Rockstar Vancouver was integrated into the Rockstar Games family. So this episode actually begins in late 2002. As Bully and Spec Ops began their very first concept stages in late 2002, very shortly after the release of Grand Theft Auto Vice City. And we know this because some extremely early concept artworks were leaked in 2019, which had markings that said 10-02 and 11-02 on them. So that gives us an estimated time frame of the earliest known stages of Buddy's concepts. However, before we cover that, we do have a very, very interesting bit of concept work to go over that surfaced in 2010, but in a very low quality image, which was from a scrapped Rockstar Games art book called Digital and Analog, the Art and Science of Rockstar Games, which was due for release in 2011, and was going to showcase a lot of concept artworks from all of Rockstar's games up until 2010. Now this got scrapped for some unknown reasons, but the only images of it online that do exist show off a very, very low quality concept artwork of Bully, which shows a much more childlike logo and what appears to be a toddler holding a water gun, which I do believe is one of the earliest known concept artworks of Jimmy Hopkins. The full resolution of this artwork has never surfaced, but it tells us that maybe the plants of Bully were going to be much more childish and maybe about primary or elementary school children before being changed to a high school setting. Sadly, not much else is known about this, but it appears it might have been changed very early on, as the other league concepts from around this time did not show any young toddlers or that many other younger children. It's such a shame the book did get scrapped, as it would have given us a massive insight into Bully's development. Anyway, going over the 2002 concept artworks, you will notice one major difference. A lot of the characters are nothing more than caricatures, with extremely exaggerated features. Such as larger bodies, tinier heads and such. For example, take the concept of Nerd and the Smart Girl. They're both really, really tiny characters, but have a massive head and massive glasses to match. While the second nerd is incredibly lanky and incredibly skinny. While the bullies, on the other hand, with completely abnormal sized arms and hands and a massive build to go with, but a normal sized head, etc. Quite a few of these characters managed to stay in from the very beginning, but obviously were changed a bit down the line. For example, Dr. Crabblesnitch, Ted Thompson, Gary Smith, Mr. O, Mr. Burton, Mandy Wiles, The Hobo, and Edna, to name some. Understandably, quite a few of these other characters did get scrapped entirely because these were concepts. Now one thing I do find insanely interesting about this part is there are a few characters on the concepts who have names, but never made it into the final product, nor do they have any character that resembles them at all. These characters being Chuck, Heather and Cassie. And considering Cassie is listed as a girlfriend, it could mean the Rockstar team most likely had a very faint outline at one of the first drafts of Bully's story before it got changed to the one we know of in the final game. Also note the artwork Gary doesn't have a name, but he is listed as a main character. It is unknown if there was another protagonist planned instead of Jimmy initially. Now with these concepts we can also tell Buddy had a much more different tone, as there are concepts of a mafia gangster, a caretaker, the um, off-putting Mr. Luns, and a stoner kid to name some, because Buddy doesn't have many of these themes during the final version. The design Buddy was going for in its 2002 concepts here seems very reminiscent to the style used in Buddy's comic style artwork, which can still be seen on the final game's loading screens. It's also worth noting we can clearly tell a fair amount of these concepts managed to stay in until the final release, as on the final game's loading screens you can see concept artwork for characters like Edna, Beatrice, Russell and Peanut to name some. Now one thing I'd like to point out with Jimmy is it seems they may have wanted Jimmy to be a much younger boy initially, as we have the toddler-like artwork which I showed off earlier, and in some of this comic artwork, Jimmy does appear to be much younger, smaller, and skinnier. Now one thing we can tell from the initial concepts is there is an extreme lack of clicks, which is one of Buddy's most defining characteristics. Now while there are designs for characters like A Buddy, A Nerd, or A Thug, it just seems the original idea was for every character to be unique in their own way instead of just being part of a group. Now these extreme caricatures seem to remain in Buddy until their own mid-development, I believe. As some of the earliest known character models in-game were found on a Rockstar developer's portfolio named Tyler Wilson, who had character concepts of the nerds, the prefects, some of the authority, and a couple of other characters. Now I believe these are from around 2004, maybe 2005 I believe, but I might be wrong on that. But you can see how characters like Edna for example was much smaller, fatter, and had a much more exaggerated face. Or how Peanut's pompadour hairstyle is much bigger, and how skinnier and uglier Ernest Jones is. Another interesting thing to note is the colour scheme. Here, everybody is using the same burgundy type of colour scheme, as opposed to something that separates them from the other cliques. It's probable that this was either a placeholder thing until they fought with some good colours, or something the team realised wouldn't work out well as players might find it difficult to tell these cliques apart. Especially in the case of vest wearers like nerds, non-cliques, bullies and preps. 
In fact, you know the logo you can see on some of the beta characters? Well this logo was actually featured on some of the 2002 concept arts. So this design for Bulwark Academy was definitely one of the first designs, but also seemed like they really wanted to call Bully's World anything that begins with a B. Now initially, Bully's theme was decided upon by Stephen Olds, who apparently had a bit of a major challenge with Bully before it even took off. On the one hand, the team wanted Bully to be seen from a child's point of view, by making everything cartoony and more exaggerated, but at the same time, not to make it look like it was a Saturday morning cartoon or just Grand Theft Auto for kids, which would explain the weird early character concepts at the beginning. Another thing the developers wanted to do was make Bully feel timeless. Instead of basing Bully in a very specific time period like Grand Theft Auto is, they wanted to add in different aspects from all kinds of different decades. So the game could appeal to younger players who'd still be in school themselves, because Rockstar knew damn well that people who weren't 18 were still playing Grand Theft Auto anyway, and older players could reminisce about their own school days too. And they did this by purposely leaving Bully's actual time period completely ambiguous, having a mixture of elements from the 60s up until the early 2000s, in the form of the in-game props, alongside the soundtrack, which itself was heavily sampled off varying tracks from the 70s to the early 2000s. So when it came to the soundtrack, originally the team never wanted to have a purely background soundtrack at all. They wanted to do something like you'd see in the Grand Theft Auto build, with a licensed soundtrack. But initially this proved difficult, as in Grand Theft Auto, with the exception of interiors, music was only ever heard in vehicles, and Jimmy was never going to be able to drive a car at all, that was never on the table. So originally they were going to include the ability to play music by an MP3 player which Jimmy would carry around with him, and the player could buy in-game music from a record store. There was also a feature rumoured that was going to be exclusive to the original Xbox, where if you ripped a CD onto the console, Jimmy could buy your custom music in-game. As some games like the Xbox versions of Grand Theft Auto and the Tony Hawk series let you play your own custom music as a playlist anyway. But this still proved to be a bit of a headache. Apparently the team could not make it work well at all, so eventually it became clear an instrumental background soundtrack was the right step forward. Lead designer Mike Scupper even stated the soundtrack needed to be based on the specific clicks, the locations, the style of missions, such as you know fast paced, stealth and you get the idea. Something that a licensed soundtrack on a handheld MP3 player just would not be able to accomplish and it would feel quite out of place in some missions. So they got down to hiring some composers for the soundtrack and initially they were going to have Mike Patton, the lead vocalist of bands like Faith No More, Mr Bungle and Dead Cross to compose the soundtrack. In an interview with Destructoid, Mike Patton even stated he was more than enthusiastic to do so as he himself absolutely loved playing games, he was a massive PlayStation fan and regarded Rockstar Games as being one of the best in the business. But unfortunately for Mike, he was actually dropped in favour of Sean Lee. The reason behind this is, according to Mike Scupper, when they brought in Sean Lee, the team were just completely blown away as they said Sean's work absolutely perfected all the references they were asking for, alongside being incredibly varied and having such a unique flavour to his own work. It's unknown how many tracks Mike Patton composed for Buddy before being dropped, or if he was replaced before he even got the chance to do so, as to this day nothing else has surfaced regarding Mike's work on the Buddy soundtrack. But there are a few leftover files of Buddy's non-instrumental background days, namely the record store, one of which does actually mention one of the albums that Jimmy could buy, which is Frankie Bushwitz's Rockin' Polka Party. And since there is no real artist in the real world named Frankie Bushwitz, it heavily implies that maybe the music that was going to be made for Buddy was going to be a custom in-studio production, like Rockstar did with a few of the songs featured in Grand Theft Auto 3. It also might, but doesn't confirm anything, that they might have let you swap between an MP3 and the background soundtrack before scrapping the MP3 feature entirely. Now it is extremely common that when anything creative is in development, the creators tend to take inspiration from many things, and Buddy of course is no exception, taking heavy inspirations from many films, games, real life places, and of course music. One of the major inspirations for Buddy was actually The Warriors, which itself was being developed into a game adaptation of the film by fellow Canadian studio Rockstar Toronto, around the same time Buddy was in development too. And initially, Buddy's combat was going to be akin to The Warriors game, and it's assumed The Warriors' reliance on use of rival factions partly inspired Buddy to take that route too. Other features from The Warriors game that found their way inside Buddy included the graffiti tagging and use of debris as weapons like bricks and bin lids. Another game that inspired Buddy was actually Shenmue, the series by Sega, which was partly used for inspiration for Buddy's combat and part of the open world exploration too. Buddy wasn't short on many film inspirations either, as it was heavily inspired by many other films, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which is what inspired Buddy's humour to be a bit more zany and wacky. Pretty in Pink partly inspired Chapter 3's plot with Johnny Vincent and Lola Lombardi. Revenge of the Nerds was used as the base for Chapter 4's story, which followed the basic plot of the nerds wanting to get revenge on the jocks even going as far as to lift the humiliating cheerleader plot wherein both the film and Bully, 
the nerds acquire nude photos of the head cheerleader and just basically humiliate her by having them shown off to everyone. Also, regarding Bullworth Academy, the absolute landmark of the game itself was very heavily inspired off Vets College, an incredibly prestigious place located in Edinburgh, Scotland, home of Roxar North. Now, Vets College, despite being named a college, is a school for children aged 7 and up until the age of 18, and it seems that Roxar Vancouver took quite a lot of inspiration from this place, such as Harrington House, which was at least inspired by Carrington House from Vets. One thing to note as well is the main colour of Vets College is magenta, while one of the concepts for Bully had its original colours being burgundy. Also, do you remember that beta logo from earlier? Well, the original logo was actually yellow and black, the colour of a bee basically. Which is also interesting because the mascot for Fett's College is a bee. Although some early 3D renders for Bullworth Academy were not based on Fett's at all. So likely this was a drastic design choice change somewhere down the line. So when it came to designing the missions, Mike Scupper wanted all the team to add in their own backgrounds to Bully and reportedly spent a fair bit of time not working on that initially, but instead sharing quite a few of their own schoolyard memories, writing them down and figuring out how they can work these stories into fun missions. The team believed it could help all players relate to something that happened to them, somebody they knew, something just something in general that everybody could relate to, citing the likes of having items stolen by buddies, girl troubles, dealing with snobs, and you get the idea, just general stuff that everybody could relate to. The side jobs that Jimmy can do, such as lawn mowing and paper routes, were included because when the team are young, that's basically how they made their own money before they got a proper job. The inclusion of bottle rockets was added because a few of the team said that when they were young, they used to have bottle rocket wars with their own neighbourhoods when they were kids. Moving on slightly, if you've ever visited the Buddy Wiki, you'll notice that nearly every single character in the game has a first and a last name. Even if quite a lot of the characters never get their last names mentioned in game at all, or in some cases, even their first. And this was a design choice by the team because they wanted to make Bullworth's world feel much more alive and relatable, and wanted to base quite a few of the characters on people they knew during their own school years as a way to really humanise the NPCs with such varied personalities even inside their own cliques. As opposed to the NPCs of Grand Theft Auto who would just not really do anything other than walk in a set path, drive in a set path, and just have a very limited amount of quotes. For example, you could take any character in Bully, no matter how big or small of a character they are, and you would get a general idea of their personality. Like, take Ivan Alexander, for example. He has absolutely zero role in the story whatsoever. But if you stand around and listen to his quotes, you'll learn that he has a sleeping disorder, he takes medication, he likes French girls, and is into cinematography. The team never had to do that, but they wanted to because they wanted to make Bullworth's world feel more alive and relatable with just how much personality all the characters had. Of course, Buddy had to go through a few massive changes to avoid being too close to Grand Theft Auto, and part of this was done with the authority figures. In the GTA games, police always knew where you were at all times. It doesn't matter how far away the map you were, the police would find you. So the Bully team wanted to make this more realistic too, as authority figures would only give chase to you if you were caught in the act or did something incredibly bad, citing the childlike mentality of running off after you know you've done something bad, so you can claim you had nothing to do with, say, a smashed window you caused. However, despite Bully sounding like it was a really fun game to make, it was not smooth sailing or even that fun creating Bully as there were a lot of problems and headache the Bully team faced. Such as Barking Dog Studios' original team, which it came from backgrounds developing strategy games, not sandbox or combat. And when originally asked to make Bully, some of the team were against the idea of, as they put it, putting children in such a violent game. Another issue the team had with Bully is the extreme lack of communication from Rockstar's head offices, as the team were ignored, misunderstood and heavily mismanaged. It's reported that Rockstar New York were even given instructions to employees who had already quit Rockstar Vancouver. Mike Scupper even said that he was constantly worried that Buddy would have been cancelled at any point during its development and the idea of cancelling Buddy came up quite a few times too, even to the point where many employees of Rockstar Vancouver had a high turnover rate because the work culture at Rockstar was just that horrible. There was a lot of overtime too, to the point many employees working up to 80 hours a week just to work on mostly Buddy and Spec Ops. Now keep in mind that Rockstar Vancouver were also working on Spec Ops alongside Buddy during this time, so you can imagine that only added to the workload, even if Spec Ops and Buddy had two different teams working on them. And you may notice that I randomly name dropped Spec Ops at the beginning of this part, and haven't mentioned it since up until this part, and that's because I didn't know where to throw in the fate of Spec Ops into this. Because even though this is a Buddy history video, it does play a role into Buddy's development, because if it wasn't for Spec Ops initially, we wouldn't have had Buddy at all. But unfortunately, I was unable to find out if Spec Ops had interfered with Bully's development or vice versa, but it does tie into the cancellation aspect, as Spec Ops was canned in 2005, shortly before Bully's announcement to the world. 
Interestingly, it was due for release in late 2005 too, just like Buddy was. The only thing known about Spec Ops is the lead guitarist at Queens of the Stone Age, Josh Hom, and Elaine Johannes were working on the soundtrack to that game. And the reason I bring this up is, earlier I mentioned how Rockstar were looking for soundtrack composers for Bully. And it's not confirmed, but I wouldn't be surprised if either of these two may have applied for that as well, especially since the soundtrack style for Spec Ops was heavily guitar based. I just wanted to give a bit of closure to that since I had no idea where to fit that into this video and ultimately Spec Ops as a series was shelved entirely until the late 2000s where Take 2 gave the series to 2K games and they made Spec Ops Alone which released in 2012 and the entire series has been dormant since. It's unknown if any ideas from the cancelled version of Spec Ops from 2005 was going to be in Spec Ops Alone and I'm not sure if the Spec Ops team went to work on Bully or were let go. Anyway, it was to the point where the team at Rockstar Vancouver just absolutely hated working on games. Not because of Bully or Spec Ops, because the team loved the concept and the creative freedoms they had, but it's because they were just extremely overworked due to the pressure and expectation given to them by Rockstar's head offices. Apparently, if somebody didn't look busy enough, they were given a new task to become busy. Another side note, this kind of stuff about Rockstar's employees being extremely overworked and being sorely mismanaged was also mentioned during Buddy 2 and Red Dead Redemption 2's development, so I wouldn't be surprised if this was the case during GTA 4 and GTA 5 as well. Anyway, back on topic. A lot of the team just felt really burnt out working on Bully and it quickly went from being a team coordinated effort that everybody enjoyed working on because of how much of a nostalgia driven project it was, to being nothing more than a dreaded slog of work. That's not to say the team didn't have a burning passion for Bully, because they did. It was just how badly Rockstar's high offices treated them all. It wasn't until Bully started getting revealed that the team felt things turn around a bit for them, but even then development still was not going well. The initial release date was pushed back twice. Originally, Buddy was scheduled for October 2005, then February 2006, before the final date of October 2006. And it seems like at some point during development, I'd say around the mid to late cycle, Buddy went through a major overhaul again. As players have noted throughout the years, Buddy has had a hell of a lot of in-development files left in the Scholarship Edition remaster, which came out in 2008, which gives us all a massive insight to how many original ideas and concepts there were more so than your average game has, because this stuff is still being found even in the 2020s, over 15 years later. A lot of this cut content as well is just dark and questionable of what we actually know Bully to be, because some of the more questionable findings that have been found include drowning animations for Jimmy, a possible alternative ending where Gary Smith died during Final Showdown, a 7th chapter, Jimmy falling into acid if he lost the Edgar Munson boss fight, the girls of Bullworth could be found walking around in their underwear in the dorm, and Happy Vault Asylum was going to be much more packed and inmates would explore the grounds ready for Jimmy to beat them up at any time he wanted. So yeah, Buddy was going to be a much more darker and adult kind of game. So that about wraps up part 2 of the complete history of Buddy. I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you did, I hope you look forward to episode 3, where we will be going over Buddy's reveal at E3 2005. So thank you for watching and have a great day.